Hey everybody, Hoosier Jedi here with another review for you. This time I'm talking about episode 10 of Avengers Assemble called Doom Destroyer. Yeah, the episode title is a little bit cheesy, but uh, well, let's face it, uh, it's hardly uh, hardly the most ridiculous name to ever come out of the Marvel Universe now, is it? Not in a, a, war, a universe that contains the likes of characters like Dr. Nemesis and the blue blade oh, oh and who who could forget the phantom reporter and yes all of those are canon marvel characters in fact dr nemesis has been hanging out with the x-men a lot recently yeah comics huh comics anyway let's kind of just kind of get right into it overall at first, I thought this was going to turn out to be an episode that was really heavy on the action and not so much on the characterization stuff. And to be perfectly honest, that's not entirely inaccurate. The thing is, though, that the character moments, and there are really a lot of very nice little moments, but that's all they are. It's just a few seconds of interesting character interaction that... It just doesn't really feel like it goes anywhere. I have—I mean, this feels like if it had been a two-part episode and we really could have seen some more of these uh, moments play out with a little bit more depth, this could have been an extremely memorable story. But here, it just—it just doesn't quite get that. Now, there's nothing wrong with packing a lot into a story, and this episode does pack in quite a lot. But if you don't Give give the elements room to breathe. If you don't let them expand just a little bit, uh, the story suffers for it. Anyway, let's kind of get into it and talk about some of the good points in this episode. Okay, first of all, nice choice in using the destroyer. Obviously, he's uh, it's a it's a uh, I can't really say a character, but it's an element from the Thor movie that people are sure to remember. And it's actually not going to be that long till the next Thor movie comes out. So it's kind of a good idea on Marvel's part to remind people of that. So nice choice there. Also, I like the idea that AIM and HYDRA are fighting over uh, Doom's technology cache. This actually reminds me of a story from the comics where Dr. Doom oh, uh, was believed dead. He'd actually been sent off to some kind of a hell dimension. And uh, that ultimately led to a really interesting Fantastic Four story. But, uh, yeah, anyway. So, uh, what happened was, in the comics, Cable led X-Force to break into Castle Doom to make sure that nobody could steal Doctor Doom's time travel technology. And uh, it was just really, it was just a fun story. You don't really get to see uh, elements from X-Men and the Fantastic Four coming together terribly often. And when they do, it's usually, you know, pretty fun stuff. You know, like the time that Wolverine slashed the thing's face so long that he had scars for years in the comics. Or when uh, the Fantastic Four and the X-Men teamed up together during Joss Whedon's run on X-Men. Yeah, cool stuff there. Joss Whedon is a guy very well suited to the Marvel Universe. I mean, he's done, you know, obviously Avengers in the movies, did X-Men in the comics, Runaways in the comics, guest appearance by the Fantastic Four in the comics, guest appearance by the Punisher in Runaways. I, gotta, I tell you, man, Joss Whedon, he is a total Marvel Universe guy, at least in, uh, you know, being able to trend, bring, them to the, bring those characters to uh, the page well. Uh, anyway, now, uh, one thing that I really liked about this episode is I really love it when heroes are forced to work with their enemies for a greater goal. And here, of course, we get to see the Avengers working together with Loki and Thor having to team up with Loki. And, of course, Loki, in both the comics and in the movies, are basically the reason why the Avengers are formed in the first place. And, of course, this leads to, you know, a lot of tension. Of course, the, re the Avengers have perfectly good reasons not to trust Loki, and these reasons are, of course, eventually validated. And Thor, you know, I mean, this is really one of the great, you know, crux, great moment things about Thor's character is that he knows he can't trust Loki. Loki, he wants to bash Loki's head in a lot of the time, but Loki is his brother, and Thor just 
always, always has to cut Loki that little bit of slack. He just can't bring himself to just flat out kill Loki. And of course Loki knows this and is perfectly willing to ruthlessly exploit it. But um, yeah, make no mistake that uh, Thor has given Loki some absolutely epic beatdowns in the comics. Uh, I think one of the all-time great moments uh, for Thor versus Loki is... Um, you know, they've been having another one of their throwdowns. Thor grabs Loki by the throat and uh, Thor throws his hammer, Maholner, away. Now, of course, Thor has the power to make Maholner return to his hand whenever he wants. And uh, he basically wants to get Loki to surrender or give him some piece of information that he needs or whatever. And he basically says to Loki, You better tell me what it is I want to know because my hammer is on the way back and your head is in the way. And Loki basically craps himself and, you know, squeals. I mean, yeah, Thor can really, really be a badass when he wants to be. It's great stuff. Uh, anyway, uh, another thing that I really liked was the Hulk makes a mention that, you know, says that I'm not a defender. Well, what's cool about that is that Hulk, for a long time in the comics, especially back in, like, the 70s, was a member of a team called the Defenders. And he's popped up occasionally as a Defender ever since then, whenever Marvel decides to try and take another whack at the Defenders franchise, which frankly seems to have pretty much permanently petered out at some point in the 80s. But still, it was really a nice little nod to people who are familiar with the Hulk's history in the Marvel Universe. And of course, it was always, to me, supremely ironic that the Hulk spent more time as a Defender than he actually did as an Avenger. Uh, the Hulk had basically bounced from the Avengers within, like, the first year in the comics. Although, if you actually go back and read those original stories where th the Hulk is um, still actually a member of the Avengers, it reads an awful lot like uh, the Hulk that we see here on the show. Uh, so, going back and reading those original comics from, like, 1963, 1964 that I did uh, some years ago was actually quite interesting. Seeing the Hulk as a member of a team especially as a full-fledged Avenger, is, uh, is, actually, is really interesting, given his, uh, that so much of him is that loner, that pursued, angry, uh, big green rage monster. So, yeah. Uh, other things. Uh, I definitely did like the moment where Black Widow called Hawkeye weird, and uh, Tony Stark like, canceling Doctor Doom's uh, digital movie cue. So, yeah, you kind of have to wonder what was on Dr. Doom's Netflix account. And you also got to wonder if Doom was actually paying for those movies or if he was just pirating them. He was probably pirating them. That, that seems kind of like the thing, the sort of thing that Dr. Doom would do. Now, uh, speaking of Dr. Doom, I also liked how they did touch upon an important aspect of Doom's character is that for all his evil behavior... The one thing, one of the things that you can always count on with Doctor Doom is that he will protect the people of Latveria. He takes that extremely seriously. Now, I'm not one of those people who really considers Doom to be a villain with noble aspects. I'm one of the, I, I'm of the camp that Doom's morality is well, basically, he'll do and say whatever he wants, and then kind of come up with some way to justify it. Basically, you know, in my book, Doom is really full of it. He doesn't really have a real sense of honor or anything like that. But even I will give him credit that he does look after the people of Latveria. He does so by terrorizing them to the point where they, they're, they you know, absolutely horrified at the thought of doing anything that might piss Doom off. But, you know, he, he does protect them from external threats, and he takes the doing so extremely seriously. There is a reason, and I don't just mean the whole political ramifications of it. I mean, Dr. Doom is technically the sovereign and legally recognized ruler of Latveria that um, people do not pick on uh, Latveria lightly. I remember a story I read in the comics where even the Punisher was like, oh man, I, I, I really, like he had inadvertently angered Dr. Doom and he it ultimately ends up with the Punisher stealing some of Doctor Doom's art collection and threatening to torture it, and ultimately using that as a bargaining chip to get Doctor Doom to agree to back off and leave him alone. 
Now there were other encounter there were a few others encounters with Doctor Doom and the Punisher later on, where uh, the Punisher was uh, a little bit more uh, upright on that. But it was still interesting to see the Punisher, the scariest, toughest dude in the one of the scariest, toughest dudes in the entire Marvel universe. Even he didn't really want to screw with Doctor Doom. Yeah. That's that's how uh, that's how intimidating the Doctor Doom is in the Marvel universe, and uh, incidentally, I seriously love the Punisher. Love the Punisher. Anyway, but uh, in terms of characterization, the real crux I think of this episode is, of course, when we get to see uh, Thor's destiny touched on again. We get to see him have his little rematch with the Midgard Serpent, and again, we get to see a nice bit of interplay between Thor and Loki. You know, and as I said. Here we see, it's really on in showcase that Thor wants to believe that there is still good in Loki. I mean, he praises Loki. He says that today Loki acted like a hero. And that Loki could continue to be a hero if he chose to be. And that's one of the interesting things about Loki, if you, if you read the stories in the comics. Is that he's a guy who basically, when he was young, really did want to be a good person. But... He, he's always, he was someone who felt horribly shackled by basically what these prophecies said. These prophecies said that someday Loki will betray us all, that he will be the destruction of Asgard. And of course, this, and well, it, it is a complicated story. But Loki is a guy who ultimately said, like, okay, everybody thinks that I'm going to be this bad, horrible person. Well, fine. If that's what you think, then I am going to do everything I can to be the monster you think that I am. And really, that's always been, for so long, the crux of Loki's character. I mean, that was kind of, to a degree, what we saw in the Thor movie. And here we see Loki having him fully embrace that in this episode. And Thor's trying to get him to turn away from that path. Futile as it is, still makes for really great drama. And, as I said, if this had been a two-part episode, if we could have really had some time to really expand on these moments, expand on these ideas, rather than just compacting everything down into 22 minutes, I think this really could have been an extraordinarily memorable story. And as it is, it just stands out as a pretty decent story. But, hey, a pretty decent story is better than a bad story, right? Anyway, guys, that's all I got for you this time around. As always, please comment, rate, and subscribe, and of course you can follow me on Twitter at Hoosier Jedi. Until next time, take care and have a good one.